Hey everyone, welcome to my social media live stream. If you're here and you're actually here live and on time, thank you, hi, welcome. I'm gonna take a minute, let people arrive, get settled, and then we will get into everything social media for musicians specifically, specifically classical musicians. That's really where my expertise lies um, because I really love helping classical musicians really branch out and reach a broader audience since Classical music has a bit of a reputation for being sort of more old school and you have to go to a concert, you have to wear nice clothes and you have to sit there quietly and that's the only way that you get to enjoy classical music or you go to the library and you get an old CD. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way, especially with modern technology. Um, so my passion is really using social media to get classical music out to more people. So thank you for being here. And um, if you're watching the archive, great. There'll still be a lot of great, oops. Classical music has a bit that go away. All right. Um, there's going to be a lot of information in here, and I'm definitely going to be taking your questions, too, so don't hesitate to be talkative in the chat. Um, I'll definitely be addressing whatever you guys want to hear about in addition to my own points. Um, so, yeah. Hello, guys. Welcome. Got to get this set up so I can see the chat. Doing a slightly different shot today, a little bit better looking. Um, usually when I do my live streams, I just put my laptop on my couch, which is slightly ghetto. Um, so I made a little bit of a new arrangement here to have a nicer shot um, and be more at the same level as the computer. Usually I have the laptop like below me, so I made a little bit of adjustments to make this stream a little nicer to watch because I'm not going to be doing any cello playing, I'm just going to be talking, so I thought I could get it all set up for that. Hi guys, welcome. So I'll give it another minute for people to get here. Um, on the topic of social media, I was posting to my Instagram. Um, my Instagram posts I have set up to automatically post to my Facebook as well. Um, so posting about the live stream on those platforms, also my Instagram story, and you know, I could put something on Twitter too. I used to have my Twitter set up to also um, do my Instagram posts but I deactivated that eventually because too many things, I don't like everything to be automated all the time because I think it's sort of important to be tailoring each post just a bit for each platform and sometimes there's limits on how long a caption can be so then a caption will get cut off on a certain platform and it's not a good look so um, I now do most of the things manually. Um, but so hello everybody, hi if you're just joining. Um, we're going to talk a lot in the chat. I'm going to take your questions. I'm really going to be keeping an eye on what you guys are saying so I can make sure to address everything. So we're just going to wait about another minute for people to get here. I'm going to do a little post for Twitter right now uh, while we do that, and then we'll get going in just a minute. And yes, I have very fast one finger typing, which I don't think anything about, but then anytime someone sees me on my phone going at it with one finger, people comment. Okay, there's that. Some good hands-on examples of me doing the things I'm going to talk about. All right, and happy, what is it, Thursday? Happy Thursday. All right. Exactly. Cello has overdeveloped my, oh, except I'm using my right hand, but both hands, they get, they, I've actually heard there are studies that they, I guess they studied the brains of string players and found that whatever part of the brain controls the muscle memory of your hands and your fingers, that string players are like heavily overdeveloped in that area, which makes sense. All right. The social media is done, so now we can just talk about it. Okay. Um, can we start, and I am going to take questions, but I'm trying to stay on the social media topic as much as possible today. That's what this stream is going to be all about. But Alex, uh, can we learn the Baroque cello without knowing the modern cello? 
just a quick aside, but, oh, thank you for the retweet. Um, so I had the same question. A lot of modern teachers want you to um, not do that. But if you think about the Baroque period, they were obviously learning the Baroque instrument before the modern instrument because the modern instrument did not exist. So of course you can learn starting from Baroque. Um, but you need a teacher. The most important thing with learning Baroque technique or any kind of technique is you just need a teacher who understands your goals and knows how to work with you at the level that you're at. So you can absolutely start on Baroque cello, um, but it would still be starting like a beginner regardless, um, which would just be very basic fundamentals for a while because string instruments take a long time to learn how to play and sound even halfway decent on. Unfortunately, they're not like the piano and other instruments that are a little more friendly. You can get going and sound okay, you know, after a couple weeks. Cello and string instruments take a lot longer. So the beginning stages of learning modern or Baroque cello are going to be very similar in that they're going to be very slow going in the beginning regardless. Um, but you can really, yes, you could learn Baroque starting as long as you have a teacher there to help you along. All right, social media. So um, I'm a little biased because I love social media. I always have. I recently had a friend from high school just reach out to me. She saw my social media program that I just launched, which I'll talk about later in the stream, um, and said, like, what a great thing for you to do. You know, you were so ahead of all of us. Like, you had your MySpace before the rest of us. You were doing selfies. And it's true. I was taking selfies before they had, you know, front-facing cameras. I was just putting the camera out and, like, became a master at doing it that way. Um, but I've always loved social media because for me personally, I love to have a platform to express myself and I'm not someone who likes to go around the world expressing myself and forcing people to listen to me. I'd rather have a place that is a designated place where I can express myself creatively, artistically, my thoughts, my opinions, my personality, whatever. And that's what social media is. It's a perfectly curated avenue for you to share whatever you want to share. So of course, we all know it's super useful professionally for career reasons and getting yourself out there. Um, but it just really, if you can take to it with a more sort of personal approach of what do I want to share with the world, I think that's what makes social media really great. I think we get into a bad zone with social media when people feel like they are supposed to do certain things with social media or that they're supposed to do certain practices a certain way or they're supposed to talk a certain way or they're supposed to share a certain kind of thing. Um, or they look at what other people are doing and they kind of try to emulate that or they think, oh, I'm supposed to get people to engage with what I'm doing, so let me do something that makes them engage. And everything becomes really contrived and that's where we get messy because then people kind of resent social media because it feels like this thing that they have to do and they have to act a certain way and say certain things and it doesn't feel authentic to them. But the problem with that is that if you're not being authentic on social media, it's not going to connect with anybody. So it's like you're hurting yourself and hurting your audience and it's all just kind of going in this weird way because... We have all these ideas around social media and what we think it's supposed to be based on what other people do. Um, but really, social media can be a lot of things. And I think there are much more baseline approaches to social media that aren't so caught in the weeds. And when you understand those baseline approaches, like, who am I? What am I trying to communicate? What do I want to say? How do I want to say it? You know, what do I like? Those types of basic questions. When you answer those, how to use your social media becomes a lot more clear. Um, a lot more organic, and then people can tell. It makes a big difference. So we'll get into all that kind of stuff soon. Hello, guys. Hi. Thank you for joining. Um, so that's a little bit on me and social media. So yeah, I was going to go a little bit longer about that. I've just always, like, yes, I had MySpace back in the day. Um, I was really big on live journal. I loved writing in my live journal, and I have it all private now so nobody else can read the types of things I was saying when I was 13 and 14 years old but I go back and read the archive all the time it's a really fun way to have an archive of my childhood um but I remember when Instagram first came out and I was super into it because I always loved photography and taking photos uh you can see I'm bad at pointing these black and white photos going up my wall are um, film photos that I developed myself in high school when I was taking a photography class and we were doing our own developing in the dark room and stuff so I always really liked photography, so Instagram was natural for me. I always gravitated towards it. And I started using my Instagram just for personal use, but I really liked the platform. And then I decided I was going to make it more of like a real cello musician Instagram account, so I made some adjustments. And then Instagram has become my largest platform um, completely organically. This was before the days, and we'll talk about this stuff too, 
These days you can buy fake followers, you can do all sorts of tactics that make people maybe follow you or make people find your account. Um, but they're all, in my opinion, very questionable tactics because they may inflate your numbers to look big, which kind of matters. But if you have people following you or bots following you or just fake accounts following you so that your numbers look bigger, that's not serving any purpose. You're not getting any, you don't have any real fans when you have fake people following you. You don't have any real engagement. You don't have people who are going to buy your products, go to your concerts, listen to your music. It's just fake numbers. So I really like to take the focus away from the numbers and onto what kind of audience do you really have? What kind of people are supporting you? How much do they support you? And, um, are you getting real growth with people who are truly interested in what you're doing? And in order to do that, you have to be doing something really demonstrating what you have to offer, um, which we'll get into that too. I know I'm just basically giving a bunch of cliffhanger uh, comments right now until we get going a little bit more. Um, you guys all have the Baroque cello question, so it's fine. I'm happy to take them in between stuff, but I do really wanna stay on social media stuff as much as possible for this stream. I do not avoid the open A on Baroque cello. I use the open A as much as I can. It's an amazing sound, an open gut A string. Can't get that sound anywhere else. So um, I use open A as much as I can on Baroque cello. And hopefully you guys are all hearing me fine. If anything sounds funny, let me know if my rings are too jingly. That's like my concern if I can already hear myself jingling every time I move my fingers. Um, all right, so back on social media. So I really would love to address um, some of the things that people, the negative ideas that people have around social media. So if you have any of your own, um, definitely throw them in the chat. Do not be shy because I rely on you guys asking me stuff to give me stuff to talk about. I can always talk aimlessly on my own, but I'm, I'm really happy to address what you guys want to know about or what your concerns are. Um, so a big problem already, I think, is there's a there's way too much like try hardiness. Everyone's trying really hard on social media, um, or that you see that often for the people who really want to get a social media following, like they're really trying. But um, sometimes we end up trying in these ways that are just not authentic, that don't resonate with people. And you're much better off being yourself, sharing what you care about, doing it in a way that's true to you, and that's what's gonna grab people. Not saying. What are you guys up to this weekend? That's not gonna make anyone excited about you and what you do, asking a question like that. In fact, that's a social media tactic that makes no sense to me that I see people doing all the time and I never see it have any success and I don't know who is teaching people that you should say, what are you guys up to this weekend? What's your favorite way to blah, blah, blah? If you genuinely wanna talk to your audience about that, more power to you. But if you're using tactics like that to think it's gonna get you engagement, I haven't seen it work and personally when I look at someone's post and they ask me what am I doing this weekend, I don't feel compelled to leave a comment and tell someone what I'm doing this weekend. I would rather gain some information about them or get a little insight into their world. That's why we follow people on social media because we like them, we want to get to know them, we want to know what they're up to, we maybe like whatever type of content they produce, in this case it would be music. Um, but we're following people because we want to know about them. So shifting the focus on what are you guys doing is kind of like, what is the point of that? The social media is telling people about yourself, presenting yourself. So there's a lot of self-awareness and self-confidence that goes into it as well. So if you're lacking in those areas, like you don't know what's important to you. You don't know who you are. You don't know how you want to come across. Those are like step one. You're not going to have successful social media without knowing who you are and what you want and how you want to communicate it. Um, and all of these things are things um, that I do address in my coaching program because I think this is a much bigger, broader picture. It's not about like, do these secret tips and then you'll have thousands and thousands of followers. Um, like I said, there's a more baseline thing going on here about who you are, what you provide, and if you're being authentic to that, that is what really brings and draws people in. Um, do you measure your social media impact for your own campaigns or just go with the flow in social posting and such? It depends where you're at. Um, when I was really trying to grow my platforms more, I was paying closer attention to like, how many likes did I get? How many comments did, did anybody share this? Did people do this? When you're really on that growth track and you want to grow fast, it's good to be aware of your stats and how your posts are performing just because 
our audience, the people following us will teach us the most. We have to be authentic to ourselves, but there's still a lot of things that we could be doing and sharing that are authentic. And we need to be paying attention to what, which things are connecting with people, which things are people excited about. And you may be surprised, like for me personally, when I post videos of my playing on Instagram, um, oftentimes the videos where I think I play the worst perform the best. I don't know why that is. Maybe, maybe the ones where I'm performing worse, I'm like trying harder. So I'm like more emotional in the video and like I look more strained and maybe people like the intensity of that. Um, but it's always worth observing your numbers when you're trying to grow because you can learn a lot from that. But you don't want to get too caught up in it because it's important to sort of stay on track with what your vision is for what you want for yourself. Sometimes it's just an off day, you posted at a weird time, the algorithm didn't get it out to enough people's feed so people didn't see it. So you can't go crazy analyzing your numbers and changing your whole strategy around it, but you should be aware of it and kind of keeping track of it in case you think, oh, you know, I didn't think something like this would do that well, but it got a lot of likes. So maybe I'll do more posts, you know, that are similar to that. Um, Okay, um, let's see. Good evening. Well, it's afternoon here in Los Angeles, but good evening. Um, oh, Alisa, is that how you say your name? Or Alyssa, thank you so much for signing up. If you guys are already ready to learn more about my program, there's the link. It's in the description of the video. You can go to my website and I talk a little bit about it. Um, but I'm going to be setting up calls with everybody um, who's interested to talk all about how the program works. Um, what things do you consider as trying too hard on social media? So, um, I mentioned earlier, trying too hard. One of the things that I mentioned is the whole asking a weird question to your audience. Like, what are you guys up to this weekend? Again, if you really want to know what your audience is up to this weekend, by all means, please ask them. But if you're asking questions like, what are you guys doing? What is your guys' favorite cereal? Like if you're just asking weird stuff so that people leave a comment, I don't know why anybody does that. It doesn't work and it looks dumb in my opinion. So that to me is a big try hardy method personally. To me, I find it that way. Um, and everything can be done authentically. So I don't want to make any like huge general generalizations, but typically when I see that, meh. And then other try hardy things. Um, I think the worst that I see, um, Oh, hey, Sharp Breath Scorpion. Um, I was actually thinking of you today and wanted to email you about that. So again, not a social media comment, but I promise you that I will email you today. And I'm so sorry about the delay on that. So I will get back to you. Um, so where was I? Try Hardy. Copying other people too. It's fine to get inspired by others and get ideas. Of course, you're going to see things that excite you. Um, but trying to take what someone else does. And this is a don't that I actually had written down. I actually made like three bullet points for this, which anyone who watches my live streams know that I never prepare or script anything. But I wrote down a few things because last night I was thinking about this stream and a couple ideas came to mind. Um, and the other thing is doing things because other people do them and you think it'll work for you. It, you know, start some things, sure, they're worth trying. But if it's not authentic to you, like if someone trying to think of a good example because I think it'll paint the picture a little bit better. Um, let's say I love the ocean and the beach and um, so I take a lot of pictures by the beach because I live by the beach. Let's just say I do that um, and people love it because the beach pictures are great and let's say I'm like a surfer so it's like totally me to be by the beach and someone else and maybe I have my cello by the beach or something who knows. And somebody else thinks, oh, that's so cool, but they've like never been to a beach in their life and they live, you know, in the valley and so they got to drive out to the beach to take the photo and stuff. Maybe it'll work, but it's like if the beach is not a part of who they are, it's not a part of their vibe, trying to just copy what someone else is doing, thinking you'll get the same results is really not a smart idea because um, what rings true to people is authenticity. And you're going to hear me say that word a lot, but it's a really huge part of social media being effective. Authenticity. So if it's authentic to me to talk about the beach and the ocean, it's going to make sense. But if it's not for you and you try to do it, it's going to come across contrived and stupid. And, you know, maybe you'll have a little bit of success with it if people, if it's a really beautiful beach photo or something. But in general, 
You should be doing what's true to you because what you're doing on your social media is you are selling yourself as a brand, a persona, an image, a musician in this case, because we're talking about musicians. Um, and any, whether you are thinking about it or not, there is an, should be an underlying, almost like a mission statement for your brand of who you are that should be coming across in every post that you make. So if you are doing things that are like, now I'm this, but now I'm that, and now I like this, and oh, I guess here's me doing this, that is sending a very confusing picture to your audience. When they think of you, they're not gonna know what to think of because you're sending all these different messages. Who you are needs to be crystal clear because that's what's gonna allow people to connect to that. If you're sending mixed messages about who you are and what you like because you're copying other people, you're trying to do other things, you know, all of us have to try things out to learn. I'm not saying there isn't a certain amount of trial and error, but start from a place of truth, what you know about yourself that's true to you. That's where you start, that's what you build on, and that's what will resonate with other people. Um, okay, what's the ultimate goal of growing an audience? Should businesses only worry about numbers? Well, businesses, so I'm focusing mostly on musicians and individuals or ensembles that are trying to grow a following as musicians. So I'm not exactly commenting on businesses, um, but the goals of growing an audience are actually very different for each person. Not everybody has the same career goals or wants the same things out of social media. For me, a person who loves social media, I just wanted a big following so that I had a platform to do whatever I wanted. For me, that was solo albums, recitals, live streams and YouTube. Um, that was most of the stuff I was interested in doing, my own musical projects. And I just wanted an audience so that I could do my own musical projects and I produced them myself. So it was really easy once I had the audience to be able to sell my albums and promote my albums to this built-in audience who already liked me and my music. For other people, they may not wanna self-produce albums or do YouTube, they may not wanna do that stuff. They may just wanna have a good following so they can approach maybe companies for brand sponsorships. They want a string company to sponsor them. Or um, maybe they want more gigs doing a certain kind of thing and so they want people to be able to find them through social media. There's a lot of different goals that you can have and that's one of the things that I do talk about in my coaching program is it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. It's very much about what are you trying to achieve with social media. And maybe you don't know what can be achieved with social media, it's a lot of things, but it has to slot into your music career in a way that makes sense. Like, what are your ultimate goals? For me, I wanted to be playing recitals, doing solo projects, doing albums, having chamber music. I had my string quartet back in Boston. So for me, it was about, I just wanna do my own music and have people there who wanna hear it. But for other people, they want gigs, they want connections, uh, you know, whatever it is. So. Identifying that for yourself is also a really important piece in deciding how you're going to approach social media. Um, music in the antiquity? I have no idea. I uh, do not have a musicology PhD. I have like a music history masters, but not musicology. Um, How long did I study the box suites? Again, trying to stick to social media questions, but um, it totally depends on the suite. Like for me, I started the first suite when I was in high school and I revisited it at various points in my schooling and in my career. Um, so it really depends if you've played the suite before when you were younger or if you're starting it, um, you're starting it when you're a little bit further along and then you might need more time to just truly learn the suite. Um, it really depends. I think if you're learning a suite from the beginning, though, it's not crazy to have an entire year learning and studying the suite with a teacher before performing it. Box suites, there's a lot there. Um, okay, so hi, if you've also just joined recently and you missed the intro, we are talking all about social media do's and don'ts. I would love to have questions in the chat, so don't hesitate, even if it's like something you don't like about social media or something that you think is like really hard and weird about social media. I'm like here to address everything. Um, so feel free to put questions or even comments. If you have your own tips you want to share, put them in the chat. That's great. Has social media helped your career? A hundred percent. Social media made my career basically. Um, cause I started it pretty early on. Like I've made a YouTube channel before I was even, I think I was just my freshman year of college. I started my YouTube channel. So my YouTube channel I've had since 2006. Um, so I've had that my whole career. And then Instagram, when that became a thing, started doing that. 
Um, but it's given me this great platform because like I was saying earlier, like what I wanted to do was record albums, play recitals, do chamber music. And I just wanted an audience there who wanted to hear my music and see my performances. So by having social media, I was able to, you know, for someone else, maybe they record a solo album and then it's like, who do they promote that album to? Their Facebook friends? And I, maybe they have an email list. Maybe they have a network of people, but like, where's the fans? Where's the audience for that solo album? And like, maybe if it's signed to a really great classical label, they're going to get it out places. But in general, like we need an audience. We need fans, people who just want to listen to our music. Maybe not only our colleagues and our people we went to school with. Like maybe we need people who just want to listen to us. So um, for me, Instagram especially and YouTube, um, and then eventually Facebook too, allowed me to cultivate my own audience of people who are interested in, for me specifically, the cello, Baroque music, which is the repertoire that I performed and studied and taught about. So I was able to cultivate this audience of people who were interested in the type of stuff that I was doing and who liked me and who liked my playing. Um, so those are all people who then would buy my albums. Um, if I did a fundraiser to support my album, they would pledge to the fundraiser. Um, I have a Patreon that supports my YouTube, so they would pledge to that. So these are all people that I know who are interested in my music who are not like friends and colleagues who I'm asking for a favor. They're just people who found me and liked my music and followed me. Um, so for me, it's been my whole career practically. I mean, I teach private students and especially on the East Coast, I had gigs and concerts as well. But social media was supporting all of that. And especially what's great about social media is it supports your own personal goals. You're not reliant on anybody else with social media. You've got a little audience there and you can do what you want with it, uh, whether it's promote something, share something, whatever. Whereas real life musician life is built around gigs and connections and other people and you can't do as much yourself. You of course can, but just social media gives you that avenue to just right away do whatever you want and not be reliant on other people. Um, uh, do you think as a classical musician, especially if you are a historically informed performer, it's harder to get newer audiences? No, I do not. And um, basically being a classical musician already makes you a minority. And then making you, being an early music, Baroque music, historical person makes you even more of a minority. So I, I get being a minority. But what we don't always talk about is how much that can actually really work in our favor because there are not a lot of people doing what we're doing. So there's a great opening for people to step in and offer this early music or even just classical music at a high level. And there's not a lot of competition out there. There's not a lot of noise to fight through. Just for an example, a lot of you know that I have a side project that's now becoming more of my main project um, where I produce and write pop music, totally different than my Baroque cello stuff. And I'm bringing this up as an aside because um, I'm using all my same social media skills to build my new project that I use to build this one. But the approach is very different. The environment is very different because the music scenes are so different. Trying to write pop music versus sharing Baroque music, like that couldn't be more different. Um, so I see the challenges in going into an oversaturated market or being in an undersaturated market. And basically the way that I sum it up is there is, yes, a smaller audience for a more niche market. You can't get the same big numbers that you could if you were doing something that had more like mass appeal, but there's also less competition um, and there's a bigger opening for people to step in and take those roles and share that music with people. So I actually do think it is an advantage. And another big part um, that I can talk about more is providing things of value, particularly educational content is extremely valuable. So anything with classical music, but especially historical performance, there's so much to be taught and people are, lots of people don't even know about this stuff, but they find it super interesting when they learn. So having an opportunity to be sharing music that can also be educational really works in our favor as well. So I actually don't see it as a bad thing at all. Um, is it best to focus on one site at a time or post your stuff on every platform at once? How do you approach Instagram versus YouTube versus Twitter? Okay. Um, so for one, while everybody, if you're really trying to get your social media game up, you should have all platforms. You should have the same handle across all your platforms, stuff like that. But I do think you should know the ones that you really resonate with that you like want to spend time on every day, really on that platform, because one of them is probably going to get more of your energy and attention. For me, it's Instagram because I love photos and I just love the platform. Uh, for some people who maybe like have a lot of opinions or like they're into like news stuff and current events, Twitter might be a great place to be really active. 
they read a lot of articles, stuff like that. Twitter's a great place for that. Um, Facebook is a kind of a bit of a catch-all. Um, Facebook is good and useful, but um, it's worth knowing that Facebook is more of about an older audience, which is fine, but just know that when you want to communicate with a market that's like maybe more 40 plus, do it on Facebook. They might not be on Instagram. They might not be on Twitter. Um, so that I see Facebook as sort of like the older audience platform and then Instagram and Twitter more for the younger. Um, generally, I'm providing the same content across all the platforms and I often will, especially like for today, I had the live stream, I posted across all the platforms at once. And there are even services you can use to auto post. Like if you post an Instagram, it'll automatically go to your Facebook page and automatically go to your Twitter. You can do that. Um, but you want to be careful because sometimes little automated things get weird, captions get cut off, and it never looks as good as if you manually do it on each one yourself. And it doesn't take long. I think it's often worth doing it manually. Um, but you want to make sure everything's getting attention, like everything is at least being maintained and getting some piece of regular content, but it doesn't have to all be the same. I think that when you really connect with a specific social media platform, you should invest a little extra in that one because you enjoy it and because it's likely gonna give that back to you. Um, have you ever considered interviewing high profile early music performing artists for your YouTube stream? That's a really interesting idea, I really like that. Um, that's a really, I've never even thought of doing interviews to be honest, cause I'm always just here talking by myself, but I love the idea of doing an interview. Um, I wish I had that idea back in Boston when there, where there were even more higher profile. I mean, if I were in Europe, then I would really have a great selection of people to interview. Um, but yeah, that's a really great idea. And I'm definitely going to keep that in mind. We don't have a ton of people here in Los Angeles, but we definitely have a lot of great people in San Francisco. Um, yeah, that would be a really great idea. So thank you for that. Hello. Hi, everybody. Just looking at the chat saying hi. So where were we? I knew this conversation was going to get a little disjointed with the Q&A, um, but that is totally fine. So what was I talking about? What points have I um, talked about? So we already talked about don't do things just because they worked for other people. So don't copy people. Get inspired by other people. That is totally fine. And you can try things that other people have done if you think, oh, that's a perfect thing for me to do too. I would love to do something like that. Then great. But don't copy someone because you think what they're doing is the right thing to do if it doesn't make sense to you and doesn't feel like something you want to do. Um, people can tell. Just understand that we think social media is this superficial thing, uh, which yeah, in some ways it is because we're creating a presentation of ourselves. But again, the undercurrent, I keep going back to the undercurrent, the undercurrent will always be seen. So whether if it's authentic to you, if it's in line with who you are presenting yourself as, who you are as an artist, a musician, a person, if it's in line with all of that, it will resonate and do the right thing. If it's a convoluted, weird, try hardy, copying kind of thing, it's not going to do well. So don't even bother copying people. Figure out who you are and who you want to be and I guarantee your content will be better instantly. And that's not even talking technical details, just that is the most important thing. Um, okay, so we talked about that. Don't mimic, don't copy. I did an interview, this was like two years ago at this point, um, about social media for another uh, organization and I said, don't, they quoted me and I was like, oh, I said that, what a good quote. Um, no, I'm just trying to remember what it was. Um, don't imitate if it doesn't resonate. So just, if it's not true to you, please don't try to do it. Just save yourself the effort. Um, okay. All right, so don't expect people to follow you if you're not providing something. I think with social media, <coughs> excuse me, um, I think with social media, there's this idea like, I want all these followers. People should just follow me because I'm great and I'm cool or why can't I have as many followers as this person or whatever. But you have to think about what are you providing? Why should someone want to follow you? Like sometimes, you know, people reach out to me for social media help and I look at their accounts and I think like, if I were a person, you have to put yourself in the shoes of a person who's scrolling Instagram and they find your feed or whatever. And I'm using Instagram as an example because that's my favorite. Um, but if you just have things that are kind of there that just support who you already are for people who already know you, like here's a picture of a concert I'm doing, here's a this, and, and like there's no context kind of like 
presenting who you are, which for me, I think videos of you playing are the most important. That's a separate topic. But um, why should someone want to click the follow button when they look at you? Are you providing any value? Are you putting things up there that add to someone's life every day when they look at their feed? Or is it all just kind of like self-serving, like doesn't really provide anything? And I know that's a little bit of a gray area, kind of hard to understand what I mean by that. But I think as, as you get going into more depths of social media, which again, my coaching program is all about, you start to understand like, am I providing something here? Does this have value or not? And not everything is going to have value on social media. You know, plenty of times on mine, I posted just a selfie of me with my cello, but I have the benefit of people already follow me and like me. So that's just providing them content of, oh, okay, I already like this girl. Here's a picture of her. Cool. And they like that. But when, especially when you're trying to get people's attention it's and you're trying to really grow your following and you're trying to sell yourself like why should someone want to follow you, that's where you really have to look at how much value are you providing in your content. And I know Instagram is just, oh, it's just photos, but like visual presentation is a lot. Instagram is all about visual presentation. So if your photos don't look good, if your photos are bad quality, they're poorly lit, whatever, that's not value. People aren't going to want to follow your account. Your photos don't look good. Like it's pretty simple. You're kind of selling yourself. You want to put yourself in the shoes of the follower. Would I want to follow this person and look at this content on my feed every day? So making sure that what you're providing is worthy of people following you and not just expecting that people should follow me because I'm good at this or I do this and that. You have to show people that you're good at that and you do this and that. Um, give people the opportunity to get to know who you are and make that decision. Okay, I want to follow this person. They they seem cool. They have something to offer me in some way. Um, so that's a big one. Um, and then it's still on that topic of value. Expect the value that you put in to get returned to you. So if you are, you know, kind of not thinking much about stuff and just doing stuff because you're supposed to, don't expect a big return. But if you decide, I'm going to post a video of myself playing uh, whether it's a short clip on Instagram or you're going to put it up on a YouTube channel or whatever, the amount that you practice and prepare and you record and maybe you edit, all of that is value and time and energy that's going into what you're doing that in theory should be returned to you in some way. People will see and sense the energy and value that you put into your piece of content. Whereas if you do not really care and do not really try, people can sense that too. So again, there's a lot more stuff going on below the surface, I feel, than just the more surface level tactics. Um, oh, hey, Nick, thank you for joining. Um, we're talking everything social media and definitely taking questions and concerns, everything like that. Um, so let's see, we talked about um, being authentic, which is my number one thing for social media. And so um, my coaching program that I'm offering now, uh, which you can read it about it um, on the link there and then sign up and I'm setting up calls to sort of go over things with everybody who's interested and in what their goals are because everything is gonna get tailored to exactly what you're looking for because like I mentioned earlier, social media is not a one size fits all. We have different goals as musicians, where we want our careers to go, what we want out of social media, what feels good about social media, what doesn't. So everything that I do with each client is gonna be completely tailored to what they are looking for and what their goals are. Um, but I think that developing who you are on social media is the most important piece and the hardest piece because it takes a lot of soul searching, you gotta look at yourself and your career, what you've done so far, what you wanna do, what you're currently doing. You gotta look at every stage of where you're at, where you wanna go, and how you wanna get there. There's so many things to address. And I think that's where people get stuck on social media. It's like, there's this underlying gray fogginess of like, do I post this? Is this good? Is this good? Will people like this? Will people like that? And you gotta start from who are you? What are you doing? How do you wanna present yourself? And then everything builds on top of that in terms of what types of things you post, uh, what your tone and your language is, how you do your captions, how you make your photos look, how you, phrase your tweets, what types of things do you retweet, um, what, how often do you share things, do you have a YouTube channel, if so, what's the style of those videos, are they formal concerts, are they teaching videos, like what are you, how are you going about all of this, so in my consulting, all that stuff gets addressed so that we can make something that is perfect for the individual that has a high rate of success because it's perfectly in line with everything that you want to do in your music career as opposed to just, ah, I thought I should do this and then I was supposed to do this and then I tried to do this and then it becomes this disjointed thing where you don't see any results.
So that is that. I didn't even think I should have asked for questions on my Instagram post too, because I did post about this stream and say we'd be doing a QA. and uh, a But I did not think to ask for questions, and that would have been smart. Oh well. So what else? Do we, could we still cover? Um, there are nitty gritty like, you know, tips for every platform, but I find that, like I said, if the big picture stuff is not there, it's not gonna make that much of a difference. Like anyone who's looked at my Instagram, um, and maybe that's a good thing to talk about is, how did I get 27,000 Instagram followers? Um, and I did this in the days before you could buy fake followers before people were doing really shady, weird things to get followers or inflate their followers. Um, I got these followers before all that stuff was happening and available, so I had to get it organically. And Instagram actually has a really great um, built-in thing called the Discover page, which allows you to potentially get featured. Um, and they were also, they used to have channels. I don't even know if they still have this, but for a while they were having channels similar to the Discover page where they were curating videos because they were trying to get people to post more videos on Instagram when they first rolled out video capability, which was a big deal when Instagram did that. It made a huge difference for the platform. And I saw tremendous growth once that happened because I started posting videos of me playing. Um, and a couple of them got on the channels of either music or I think they had a string playing channel. And Instagram found my videos, started sharing them on these curated areas, and I got a lot more followers from that. Now it's mostly the Discover page, which includes both photos and videos on Instagram. And there's a lot of stuff at play with how Instagram finds this stuff and how it gets up on the Discover page and who it gets shown to. Um, there's a lot of particulars involved in that. But hashtags are the biggest and most important way to do that, and I've been using hashtags since I started, since I made my Instagram into a business Instagram. And I know there's a lot of confusion around hashtags too, which is something of course that I go over with all my clients, but um, hashtags are the best way on Instagram to get organically discovered because that's what allows people to find your stuff. Very rarely maybe something will get on a discover page without a hashtag because there are mutual friends and so there's a social overlap and sometimes Instagram will show your posts to people who, if they have friends that already follow you or something like that. But if you're looking for like a broad, broad reach, you need to use hashtags. Um, and that's, there's nothing faulty or weird about using hashtags. They're made so that posts can get discovered on the platform. So it's a really, really important way to be putting your stuff out on Instagram is using hashtags. But how to do it, and how to do it in a way that doesn't look tacky and stupid is a whole separate conversation. Um, but understanding that without hashtags, um, you have a very low chance of your account growing and getting discovered. That's a very important piece to know, for Instagram at least. I know you can do hashtags on Facebook. I'm not so sure um, how much those make a difference um, for Facebook pages. But at least for Instagram, and a bit for Twitter as well, hashtags are a really important part of the puzzle. But it's about knowing how to do it knowing which ones to use for what you're doing and also not looking really cheesy and putting 3,000 hashtags in your caption because that takes away from your caption when there's a bunch of hashtags there. Um, so there's some finer points in how to do all of that, but it is a really important piece. And that's basically how I got my following was just, I was posting regularly, which having a content schedule, knowing what to post, when to post, all that kind of stuff, which is what I do with my clients too, setting up scheduling, um, knowing, having a plan so everything, you don't have to come up with it every single day, even though I've done it that way a lot, but I'm a creative person, I don't mind coming up with an idea every single day, today I wanna do this, but it's definitely helpful to have a calendar and a schedule and a structure for how you're gonna do your posts. Um, and it help, helps keep you accountable to make sure you're posting regularly. But once you're committed to just putting the content out and actually getting it out there regularly, and then you're using strategies like hashtags, those two things working together is what will really help get your stuff out there more. Um, so that is that on hashtags. What else? I've talked a lot about Instagram. Also, I was talking about how I got my following. So follower growth is very much exponential. The hardest is getting up to a thousand followers. I always think that is the hardest because when you're under a thousand followers on any platform, you look like a user, you look like a regular person. 
someone who just added their friends, not someone who has friends and fans and followers in addition to just friends. Um, so getting people to follow you and see you as a brand or a musician or someone that should be followed that isn't just a random person, that's hard in the beginning when you're under a thousand followers. Um, and I remember for me, I was in the 800, 900, like really pushed in it hard, trying so hard to get to a thousand followers on Instagram. And I got a shout out from my friend Drew, that viola kid, you guys might know him on Instagram. He features people from time to time on his account and he had a lot more followers than me. And he featured one of my Bach videos and that bumped me over a thousand. I got maybe two, 300 followers from him sharing that. And then once I was over a thousand, it was really easy to build on that momentum and keep posting, keep doing what I needed to do. And then, you know, before you know it, you're at 3,000, then 5,000. Once you're at 10,000, suddenly you're at 15,000. Like it, it definitely, I mean, it takes time. My Instagram has been built over years. So it's not like this happens overnight, but if you're consistent with what you're putting out, your messaging is clear, who you are is clear, and you're keeping at it, the numbers get easier, I find, as you get higher up. Um, it's the hardest in the beginning for sure. So that's just always worth knowing because I think people can get discouraged in the beginning. But once you hit that threshold, then you've totally kind of set yourself up with a brand. You've gotten to practice and try out all these different things, a little bit of trial and error, see what performs well, see what doesn't. So by the time you get to a place where you've got a little bit of your own following, you kind of know yourself a little better. You had that trial phase of trying to build that following and now you can just build upon you know what you feel was most successful. Um, so that's that. So yeah, so my following kind of just grew from there. I got a couple features on Discover page. Um, I don't think I got any other big shout outs. Um, Strings Magazine interviewed me um, and Strings Magazine is probably the biggest print publication for string playing. Um, and they were doing a feature on Instagram classical musicians. So they interviewed me and uh, when they posted about that, I probably got some followers from that, um, little things. But I, other than that, didn't get any like major shout outs beyond my first one that got me over a thousand followers. And then from there, I was just building on my own with hashtags and my own content. Um, and I think, uh, question about the Brahms cello sonata. Again, trying to stick to social media. I know you guys love to ask me cello questions. Um, so, when I, I have not played the Brahms E minor cello sonata since my freshman year of college, which was now almost 10 years ago. And uh, I, my teacher had me stay on the C string the whole time. Nice sound. Um, but if I played it now, I might not because I don't think in Brahms time they would have gone up the C string. I think that is a romantic 20th century and beyond approach to play all the way up the C string. So I might not do that now, but it is a nice sound. If you're a totally modern player and you want to do that, sounds nice. Um, anyway, another big part of social media, and I was really only going to do the stream for an hour, so I guess it means I should be wrapping up, but guys, please do throw your questions or concerns or thoughts or whatever you want in the chat. Well, not whatever you want, but something related to social media in the chat, please feel free because I'm probably going to wrap up. I don't know. 10 minutes or so. Another thing I want to talk about with social media that I think people struggle with the most is that at classical musicians specifically, because this is really about, um, really about classical music. Cause that's what I'm super passionate about because then maybe I'll talk about this a little. So classical music, you know, there's so many conversations in the classical music community and at schools of how do we modernize it while, you know, preserving the integrity of the music and, uh, all that stuff. So, um, how do we, how do we make it accessible without watering it down to this bad thing where like now we have to play pop s stuff at every concert and now we have to do some gimmick to make people interested. And, you know, there's a lot of tension around the conversation of how to modernize classical music. And what I believe personally is that we don't have to modernize anything. I think people like classical music. Film music today is modeled all off of classical music. Like everyone loves the Harry Potter soundtrack. Like it's not that different than, you know, like a Dvorak symphony or whatever. Like it just really is not that different. Um, so what, uh, 
what is really important is considering, well, how do people get classical music? How easy is it for people to discover classical music and find it? It's like, do you guys remember from like, when was this? Like maybe the late 90s, early 2000s, they used to have at Target like a little like CD machine thing where like you could press a button and it would be like calming rain and it would like play a rain sound. And then you'd go to like wild rainforest and there would be like jungle sounds, I don't know. And then it would be like calming classical music. And like that was the way that people consumed classical music, like in a relaxing piano for sleep and meditation CD. It's like people can't just listen to classical music. It has to be some, but it's like all of these are like attempts. Like how do we get people to listen to classical music? And I think the problem is that we don't have classical music out there the way we have so much other music out there. Like other musicians playing any kind of style are putting their music out there on social media all the time. Um, musicians and other genres are self-releasing their music and putting it out there on Spotify and iTunes so people can listen to it. Classical music has gotten like into this box and music school, unfortunately, 99% of music schools in the United States, at least, um, they really emphasize like stay in this, you play concerts and they're in these certain environments and they have this kind of programming and they have to be this sort of way and there's like no training on like how to do anything in the modern world of how music of any other genre gets out there to people classical music has to like stay in the concert hall but not everybody lives a lifestyle where they want to go to a classical music concert on a friday or saturday night or maybe you know some people enjoy doing that but you know if you don't know this already most major you know even big symphonies they are not making their money from ticket sales. They're making it from donors and the board and the rich old people who are funding these organizations. The ticket sales are not even supporting the organizations. There aren't even enough people going to support these organizations, which is a real problem. So the question is, well, why is that? And I think it's because classical music is not where the people are. Where are people? They're on their phones, they're on social media, they're on Spotify, they're on iTunes. They're looking at stuff like right here on their phone. So we have to bring classical music into that space, which is what I've tried to do and what lots of other great young musicians are starting to do now. But we have to start making this accessible to people and we don't have to water it down. We don't have to play bad music. We don't have to do a gimmick or wear a costume or do anything like weird like that. We just have to bring it to people where they are. And for me, I was told so many times in college and beyond, like you can't be a Baroque cellist as your whole job. like that's too niche and too obscure and how are you ever going to get work and how's that ever gonna and I and especially for even putting it on social media people could easily say like Baroque cello who's going to care about that on YouTube on Instagram whatever and like I have proven like people care bring it to people at a high level good quality with authenticity and people care it's just that for whatever reason we think that's not possible and when I make the comment about high quality I say high quality because I studied very intensely. I have a master's and did so many recitals, so much practice, everything. High quality is in I have fully invested in my art form. So when I play and when I perform, people can tell that I am fully invested. Um, but that doesn't mean that everything that I have shared has been flawless or even close. And like I said, some of my top performing videos on Instagram, I said this earlier in the stream, were ones where I did not play very well, and um, but I decided to still put them up anyway. And people are not connecting. We have to detach ourselves because in classical music school, we, we think of our audience as like our teachers or like audition panel, or like we think of them as like these old school career people who are there to evaluate us on a sheet and tell us what wasn't good enough and reject us. And like that's who we think of as our audience. And that's already a big part of the problem because there are people out there in this world, I have found them, they follow me, like who like classical music, who think it's cool, they might not even know that much about it, but they like it. And we have to be reaching those people. Those are the people who will follow you, who will like your posts, who will go to your concerts, who will buy your CDs. Not audition panels, not teachers, not old people, not professors. Those are not the people we need to be impressing, in my opinion. Um, if you are someone whose main goal is to just get high profile gigs and you want to use social media to get discovered by high profile people who can hire you, that's a different approach. And that's again why in the consulting, everything is tailored to your own personal goals. 
But if your goals are just to have a following of people who would go to your concerts, people who would listen to your music, people who would pledge to your fundraiser, whatever it is, you have to be creating a world that is inviting to those people. And those people don't care if you're a little out of tune or if your tone is a little, eh. Like, if your music is there, your musicality, and you're being authentic and you're playing, people will connect to that. People don't have the trained, crazy ear that we learn in music school and we think that the audience is sitting there with that critical ear that our teacher had. But that's not the way the audience is. And that's a big thing that I really want to stress with social media is we're trying to reach the masses, the people, the audience. And that's not the same as trying to impress an audition panel. Um, and we can be a little messier. We can be, we can try things. We can be imperfect. People like imperfection. That's what people connect with. If something is so manicured and polished and perfect, it's not relatable. So getting people to feel comfortable sharing themselves, even when it's imperfect. You know how many people have shamed me about my videos and my this and that? Oh, that's not very good. Oh, you sure you want to post that? You think I care at this point? I would not, if I put every video I posted and every single thing I did, if I put it up to the scrutiny of like, would an audition panel like this? I would never post anything. So you have to get over that hurdle of trying to make it like audition perfect and understand that you're trying to touch your audience right now. The people who are going to sit in the seats and love what you do. Those are the people you're trying to connect with. And they don't care if you're a little out of tune. They really don't. No one would be following me <laughs> if they did care. Um... All right. What else, guys? I'm going to wrap up in the next five or ten. So if you have any lingering questions or thoughts, if you joined late, um, definitely watch the archive back of the stream because we covered a lot of stuff. And I am staying fairly big picture on this because, like I said, everything should be personalized to exactly how you want to present yourself, what your goals are, etc. Um, and I guess I didn't talk about my... Um, my program very much. In fact, I realize now that I did not make this look perfect. Fixing that. Still kind of messed up. All right, I'm gonna leave that alone. Who cares? So my coaching program is designed, for a while I was offering like one-time consulting sessions on social media, kind of like a private lesson where I would just meet with someone once and give them some advice. But what I realized about that is it's kind of like you just blow a bunch of information at someone and then send them on their way and they kind of have to figure it out from there. And so what I'm doing in this new program is more ongoing support where we spend a lot of time really developing what I talked about earlier, your brand, essentially, your persona, who you are as a musician. I mean, persona and brand makes it sound a little like corporate, but just who you are and why people should want to follow you and listen to your music. So actually developing that so that that image is crystal clear and we can build everything on that. And then going through your goals of what you want to use social media for, what kind of music career you want to have, and how is social media going to play into that? How is social media going to support the kind of career that you want to have? So time spent on that. And then actually planning out posts, trying out different things, you know, addressing whatever kind of concerns and fears you have along the way. Because like I said, especially as a musician, classical musicians, we're so overtrained, we're so trained to be scared. Or trained to make everything perfect. So I know there's a lot of hurdles and insecurities that go along with sharing your music and, and putting yourself out there in that way. So the idea of the ongoing support is I'm really there to, to be there supporting you, helping. When you have an insecurity, you have a concern, I'm there to talk you through it. I'm there to go over it with you. Like it's really more of like a partnership role where I am, because instead of just like, here's some advice, go do it now. I want people that are really trying to grow that I can use my expertise and my skills to really help support in more of like a longer term fashion. Um, so that's how the coaching works. Um, and all this stuff that I talked about, you know, I could go on about all of it forever, but it'll be most useful when I'm really tailoring it to each individual, to their music. Um, and I'm also hoping to use my platform. I already use my YouTube channel um, sort of featuring other people. If you haven't seen the collaborators area of my YouTube channel, but I do all sorts of stuff featuring videos of other early music people because I'm really trying to use all my platforms now. Um, as a way to feature other people and get more exposure for other people because I've built this platform of people that love classical music and I want to be sharing that exposure with others. Um, so especially for my social media clients, I'm going to help as soon as I feel they're ready to get some sort of exposure 
on uh, my platforms. I'm definitely going to be doing that as well. Um, because like I said, shout outs can make a very big difference as long as you have something that is worth following. Remember that it all comes down to, are you worth following? Are you providing content? Are you providing value? Should someone want to follow you? Because all the shout outs in the world or the exposure, when people go look at your account, they decide, do they click that follow button or not? And that's on you, how your feed looks, how you've presented yourself. So even the exposure will not get you the followers if you don't have everything set up to really receive that. So that is about it. And now there's like some commotion going outside of my apartment, which is distracting me. Classic home studio problems. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you found this useful. If you are interested in the social media coaching, definitely check out that link or you can, there's a clickable link in the description of the video. Um, and I'm assuming I can only fit so many slots of people. So I'm assuming they're gonna fill up pretty fast. So if you are interested, I definitely recommend uh, submitting the form. It's a very simple form to fill out. Um, doing that as soon as possible so we can get in conversation about it and get it scheduling because I'm not going to be able to fit probably everybody. Um, so yeah, that's my quick and dirty on social media. I do love social media. It's an amazing tool and it's just about using it in a way that feels true to you and knowing what you're trying to achieve with it. There's a lot of aimless social media use going on, kind of muddying up everything. And I'm about really getting clear on your goals who you are and how to present it. And I guarantee everything falls in place after that. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you're watching this as the archive, feel free to leave comments and questions too. Um, and yeah, thank you guys for joining me live. I try to do these live streams on YouTube about once a month, whether it's a Q and A or usually it's been Q and A. Sometimes I do a little cello playing also. Um, and if you're new to my channel, be sure that you subscribe. Um, I offer social media career coaching stuff on the channel as well as my Baroque cello, chamber music, other stuff that I have on here. So thank you guys so much and I will see you next time. Bye.